Hi, let's talk a little bit about ovarian reserve tests. And this series of talks will include a discussion of FSH, both a baseline and clomiphene challenge test, AMH, and antral follicles, as well as a discussion of how they interrelate with one another. I'm going to break up this lecture into several smaller parts so that you can listen to the section that is most interesting to you. And this is an overview in this section. I first want to comment that there is a difference between the number of eggs and the quality of eggs, although they are related. But they are not the same. So in other words, we use the term ovarian responsiveness to indicate the number of eggs. And obtaining eggs doesn't mean that they will make a baby. We use the term ovarian reserve to indicate quality. But a limited number of eggs does not mean that they will not make a baby. Nevertheless, women who produce a limited number of eggs usually have reduced embryo quality and hence the relationship between these two measurements. The reason I bring this up is that many studies look at ovarian responsiveness. They look at these measurements. They see how many eggs were retrieved at IVF. And partly that's because it's so easy to get that number, whereas it's much harder to wait another nine months to see how many times a baby would be born. Um, and while there is a relationship between these two, I think it's important that you understand that not all studies that claim a relationship um, are really looking at babies. Now here's data from the 2009 CDC report, and 2009 is the latest year for which we have these numbers. And I want to point out that as we go from younger to older, we see that we do get eggs out of most women, even women well into their reproductive age time. And if we get eggs, we usually get embryos. But there's a big difference between having embryos that we can transfer in the uterus and getting a baby. And the difference between the number of embryos transferred and getting a baby, um, that difference increases as one gets older. So here, Still, most women got a transfer, but not very many, many women got a baby. So why do we test for reproductive aging issues? Well, we think these are critical tests for a comprehensive reproductive medical evaluation. And this information is really needed to make an informed choice. I mean, often, um, People are asking themselves, should they invest the time to try simple approaches first, um, or should they become more aggressive? Uh, do they have the time to delay their infertility treatments because of career or social reasons? Um, many people are wondering if they should or really need to invest money in high-tech ART. And if people are willing to skip IVF for personal reasons, they just don't like the idea of it, um, if they know that their time is short because of these tests, then they may not get another chance at IVF. So um, even for people who think they don't want IVF, this information can sometimes make it easier to understand what you're choosing. And that is that maybe you're choosing to lose your most important opportunity at a successful pregnancy. So these treatment decisions are tough enough, but without adequate data, they become really difficult. And so I'm going to argue that to make better decisions about treatment options and our expectations for the outcome of those treatments, um, these tests are really helpful. Let's review a little bit of the physiology, and that is that there are about 7 million eggs in ovaries before birth. There are 3 to 4 million eggs at the time of birth. There are 400,000 eggs. When a woman starts to menstruate, a woman uses 500 to 1,000 eggs every month, and the eggs are essentially all gone at menopause. This study um, 
looked at data from three other research studies where they took um, surger ovaries that were removed surgically and they counted all the eggs in the ovaries. And what you see is there is a steady decline of eggs until about age 37 or 38 when there seems to be a more rapid loss of eggs. You will also notice that at the time of menopause, there still can be as many as a thousand eggs in the ovary, but these eggs are not responsive to hormones and generally not available to us to help people have babies. Uh, but it also explains why uh, every once in a while a woman can actually be in menopause and get pregnant because in fact there are a few eggs in the ovaries and at that time FSH levels are very high and one of these eggs might actually respond and pop out, but it's pretty uncommon. When we look at a variety of reproductive hormones and measurements, we find that those decrease when we go from young, middle, to old, reproductive-aged women defined over here. So we see that the number of antral follicles goes down, the ovarian volume goes down, the size of the ovaries go down, the total volume of follicles goes down, and the mean or average follicle volume goes down. And at the same time, follicle-stimulating hormones levels go up because there are fewer eggs to respond and they're more resistant. Here are live birth data for the United States looking at the number of births per thousand women. And you see that fertility peaks at about age 25 to 29 and it decreases rather rapidly such that by age 40, virtually 90% of fertility is gone. So we are in a race to help you have your baby uh, and your family before you cannot. And female age is a critical uh, factor in our decision about what treatments to use and when to use them and also how effective they are likely to be. We can't expect someone who does IVF at age 40 to have the same success rate as somebody who's 30 because that's not true in nature and it's not true with uh, reproductive medicine. Another problem uh, behind those lower and lower uh, live birth rates are miscarriages. And so a woman has an increased risk of miscarriage, uh, which becomes more, much more rapid after age 35 to 40. And this is true in a lot of different populations and despite a lot of different treatment types. Uh, as, as I've uh, mentioned in some other um, uh, seminars and video uh, presentations, um, the, the basis for all of this, we believe, is genetics. And so in this study in which the researchers removed eggs from non-infertile normal volunteers and stained the eggs for the chromosomes in orange, the spindle in green, um, if you recall the process of meiosis, uh, the spindle lines up the chromosomes, allows them to divide, uh, and then pulls the chromosomes apart to each end of the cell. So when the cell divides, there's an equal number of chromosomes at each side. And it's easy to imagine that happening in these 20-some-year-old women. Now let's look at the eggs of 40-year-old women. And what we see is that the chromosomes are all over the place. Right? The spindle is irregular. It's dis disordered and disruptive. It's very difficult to imagine these chromosomes splitting equally, and that results in abnormal chromosomes, abnormal embryos, and failed live births. So how do we test for reproductive aging? Well, basically, we know from a variety of studies then that as the number of eggs in the ovary uh, change and go down with age, um, which we see here, um, other hormones are changing. So um, the lower the number of, uh, uh, of eggs, the higher the age or the FSH level. On the other hand, um, the, for instance, with AMH, the higher the AMH, the higher the level of eggs. The more antral follicles we see, the more eggs there are. 
So with some hormones, there's an inverse relationship and some there's a, a direct relationship. If we look at the hormone basis for testing, we see that there, we have the brain up here and the brain makes a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone, which goes to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland then produces a hormone called FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. FSH stimulates the follicles to grow and to produce estrogen and inhibin, which feed back to the brain and decrease the level of these hormones. So there's a feedback loop between the brain and the ovary. Now in the ovary, we can measure antral follicles, the ones that have grown large enough that we can see. And those are the follicles that also produce a hormone called anti-Mullerian hormone. So these are the key tests that most people are measuring. While there are some other tests um, and other hormones, I'm really not going to talk about these uh, because they're not commonly um, used. And so I'm going to keep this sh uh, shorter for brevity. All right, a couple of uh, summary comments. We have baseline values of hormones called FSH and AMH. We have ultrasound values of antral follicle counts. And we also have some dynamic tests, for instance, of FSH called a Cloma Challenge Test or Clomiphene Challenge Test. We have general consensus that evaluation of ovarian reserve is important. We have a lack of consensus for what is the best test and how to apply those results. And it depends on who you talk to. So be prepared for some differing opinions on which tests to use and how to use those tests. I hope this uh, brief introduction is helpful and I'm going to make some separate videos on the individual tests. Thanks a lot.